from London, we present Bel Traffio, adapted by Norman Ginsbury from the story by Henry James. Did you have a comfortable journey, Mr. Harvey? Yes, thank you, Mr. Ambient. Through the prettiest country imaginable. Yes, it is lovely. Ah, here's the trap. Climb in. Ah. It's only about ten minutes to the cottage. It was kind of you to ask me down. I felt quite uh, exhilarated when your letter arrived. I asked you earlier, if you'd written earlier. You've had your letter of introduction for a very long time. Why didn't you use it before? Oh, the, the pleasure of meeting you was going to be so great that I wished to feel it and, and savour it. And not to mix it with the satisfactions that are, well, uh, more usual. Ah. My visit to the author of Beltraffio was to be a trump card. Well, you met me now. We've had some minutes' conversation. Do you still think your visit is going to be a trump card? I have no doubt about it. Beltraffio was published three years ago. I've read it five times. And now, with my riper judgment, I admire it as much as ever. But despite that, you delayed sending me your letter of introduction. I uh, heard you were working on a new book. I am working on a new book. And yet I asked if I might call on you. <laughs> you see, sir, my impatience to meet you outmatched all my reasons for not meeting you. <laughs> I'm glad it did. A short respite will help my work, and a critic who can criticize will help it even more. Here we are. Jump out. What a delightful place. Yes, isn't it? Uh, my wife must be somewhere about. Uh, let's go and look. Oh, yes, there she is over there in the garden. The boy's with her. Uh, your son? Yes, our only child. Dolcino, come and see your daddy. No, she won't let him come. Uh, we'd better join them. Uh, uh, come along, they're, they're having tea. Oh, my dear, this is Mr. Harvey. Oh, how do you how do? do? You? Mrs. Tabor, I'll vicaress. Uh, how do you do? How do, you do? <laughs> this is Dolcino. How do you do, sir? I'm very well, Dolcino, thank you. How are you? I'm very well, too, thank you, sir. How are your chrysanthemums, Mrs. Tibor? Oh, very healthy. I've been pinching them out. Yeah, that's right. But don't go on after the end of this month. Oh, I never do. As a matter of fact, I shall probably finish this evening. I was just telling Mrs. Ambient I must leave, or I'll never, never, never finish my pinching. <laughs> Wasn't I, Mrs. Ambient? You were, Mrs. Tabor. I was also saying how impossible it was to tear myself away from your fascinating Dolcino. <sighs> well, but there you are. Tear myself away, I must. Goodbye, dear Mrs. Ambient. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr... Uh, Harvey. Uh, Harvey. <laughs> Goodbye, ma'am. And good luck with your pinching. I'll walk to the gate with you, Mrs. Tabor. Uh, come with us, Dolcino. No, stay with us, darling. Can't I go with Papa? Not when I asked you to stay with me. Come along now. Papa, Mama wants me not to go with you. But he's very tired. He's been running about all day. He ought to be quiet till he goes to bed. Otherwise, he won't sleep. He's a precocious little pet. Well, you ought to be quiet now, just oh, the same. Oh, well, let him choose. Uh, will you go with me, Dolcino, or will you stay with your mother? Oh, it's a shame. I don't think I can choose. But I've been a great deal with Mama today. And very little with Papa. My dear fellow, I think you have chosen. Hmm? Come along. There, the three of us will go to the gate together. Soon be back, Mama. Uh, well, that gives me a chance to talk to my guest anyway. I can't tell you the pleasure to me of finding myself here. I have the greatest admiration for your husband. He'll like that. He likes being admired. He must have a very happy life then. He has very many worshippers. Oh, yes. Uh, I've seen some of them. For me, he's quite the greatest of living writers. I can't judge. I know he's very clever. Oh, he's nothing less than superb, Mrs. Ambient. To see him in this familiar way, and to find the man as delightful as the artist, I assure you that to me, this is a red letter day. We're very much afraid about the fruit this year. Uh, doesn't it promise well? No, it doesn't promise anything. The trees look very dull. We had such late frosts. Is Mr. Ambient fond of gardening? He's very fond of plums. I hope your crop will be better than you fear. <laughs> oh, it's a lovely old place you live in. The whole impression is that of some of the places he's described in his books. Your house is like one of his pictures. It's a pleasant little place, but there are hundreds like it. Oh, it has his tone, Mrs. Ambient. His tone? Surely he has a tone, Mrs. Ambient. Oh, yes, he has indeed. But I don't consider that I'm living in one of his books. Not in the least. Um, 
can you tell me when we might expect the appearance of the book he's working on now? I'm afraid you... You think I know much more about my husband's work than I do. You see, Mr. Harvey, I... I don't read what he writes. <laughs> he's coming back now, so you may ask him about the new book yourself. But don't you admire his writings, Mrs. Ambient? Don't you admire Beltraffio? Admire them? <laughs> oh, of course, he's... he's very clever. Come along, Del Chino. The vicaress has returned to her vicar. <laughs> it's a pity the vicar doesn't call more often. I think so, too. Hasn't Gwendolyn arrived yet? Oh, if she has, I haven't been told. Gwendolyn is my assistant, Mr. Harvey. Ah. Come, don't you know? It's your bedtime. Oh, not yet, Mama. Yes, darling, you must. Oh, can't I stay up just a little longer? No, no, not tonight. <laughs> Come with me, darling. Go with your mother, don't you know? Come along. Oh, dear. Good night, Papa. Good night, my boy. Mm -hmm. Sleep well. Good night, Mr. Harvey. Good night, don't you know? Ah, that's an extraordinary boy of yours, Mr. Ambient. Mm -hmm. I've never seen such a child. Why do you call him extraordinary? Oh, he's so beautiful, so fascinating. Like some perfect little work of art. Oh, don't call him that. Or you'll, you'll make his little future very difficult. I wouldn't for the world take any liberties with his little future. I should only be highly interested in watching it. You Americans notice more things than we do. As for my small son, we should probably kill him between us before we're done with him. And you mean by spoiling him? No, by fighting over him. Do you know, my wife asked me more than once whether I should like Dolcino to read Beltraffio. I told her I hoped he'd read all my books before he was 20. Then she asked me if I proposed to hide them or lock them up in a drawer until he was the right age. Yes. I said we must tell him they're not intended for small boys, and she replied that it was going to be very awkward when he was about 15. The difference between my wife and me is simply the opposition between two distinct ways of looking at the world which have never succeeded in getting on together. My wife will tell you that it's the difference between Christian and pagan. It's really the difference between making the most of life and making the least of it. So that you'll get another, better life in some other time and place. Perhaps I care too much for beauty. I delight in it. Don't you think my wife is beautiful? I think she's quite beautiful. When we married, I wasn't aware of the differences I mentioned. I thought it all came to the same thing in the end. Perhaps it will, but I don't know what the end will be. Moreover, I care for seeing things as they are. But you mustn't talk to my wife about things as they are. She has a moral dread about things as they are. I suppose she's afraid for Dolce. Ah, uh, nothing shall ever hurt him. Nothing. <laughs> You're both agreed about that, anyway. Oh, of course. In our different ways. My wife thinks me immoral. That's the long and short of it. Very strange, isn't it? She's a very nice, remarkably well-behaved woman, and yet she's, she's quite an angel of propriety. Yes, that's it, propriety. When I married her, I simply took her for an angel, but I never asked myself for what. Now you've told me, propriety. <laughs> yes, but her conception of life is so false that it makes me blush. And what's more... Oh, look, there's a light in Gwendolyn's room. That means she's arrived. Your sister? Yes, she comes and stays with us twice a year for a month. Uh, I hope you'll like her. Uh, uh... Why shouldn't I? No reason at all. My wife doesn't, but as she's a person of conscience, she puts her best face on it. Or oh, they're very different. The usual feminine hypocrisies on either side cost them much more than the usual effort. Oh, but they manage. Now, perhaps we'd better go and uh, change for dinner. Hello, Gwendolyn. All alone? Yes. Uh, Mr. Harvey and I have come to join the ladies. Where's Beatrice? With Dolcino. The nurse called her to see him a quarter of an hour ago. Oh, why? Well, he seemed a little feverish. He was perfectly all right this afternoon. Beatrice says you walked him about too much. She says you almost killed him. Beatrice must be very happy. She has an opportunity to triumph. Uh, surely not if the child's ill. My dear fellow, you aren't married. You don't know the nature of wives. Oh, possibly not, but uh, I know the nature of mothers. Beatrice is perfect as a mother. I'm going out to see him. Beatrice won't let you see him, dear. Do you call that being perfect as a mother? From her point of view, yes. Oh, damn her point of view. I'm going up. It's all so very odd. But we are odd, aren't we, Mr. Harvey? It hadn't occurred to me, Miss Ambient. Don't you find us odd? Have you people like us in America? Oh, we've no one like your brother. I may go as far as that. You're probably more persons like his wife. I can tell you that better. When you've told me about what you've just called her point of view... Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, she doesn't like Mark's ideas. She doesn't like them for the child. What has that little fellow to do with ideas? Oh, surely he can't tell one from the other. 
Has he read his father's novels? Well, he's very precocious and very sensitive. And his mother thinks she can't begin to guard him too early. When one has children, what one writes becomes a great responsibility. Children are terrible critics. I'm really glad I haven't any. Do you also write, then? In the same style as my brother? Oh, I wish I could. Well, Mark, did you see him? No. She won't let me in. She's locked the door. I'm afraid to make a noise. If he were very bad, she'd have let you in. She tells me from behind the door that she'll let me know if he's any worse. That's very good of her. I'm going to wait up. No, don't stay, Gwendolen. Somebody must get some sleep. If you prefer it, Mark. But if you shouldn't need me... If I you... need you, you may be sure I'll call you. Good night, then. Good, good night, night, Good night. There can't be much the matter with the boy. Children frequently run high temperatures. It's much less serious with them than with an adult. Mm, yes, all the same, I think. What was that? I didn't hear anything. It's Beatrice, moving about in the boy's nursery. I'm sure she'll be down in a moment. I'll stay here till she is. Yes, she's still there. Yes, I can hear her now. Some critics have regretted that in my books, having gone so far, I haven't gone further. Oh, I'm not one of them. In my opinion, you've arrived at what I call a noble rarity. No one can go further than that. Perhaps not. Now, I want to be truer than I've ever been before. I want to give the impression of life itself. When I see the kind of things that life, the brazen hussy, does, I despair of ever catching up with her peculiar tricks. You have to observe her minutely for a lifetime before you know what she's up to, and then... When you write the truth, the bon gens roll up their eyes at what they regard as your cynicism. But, of course, we mustn't worry about the bon gens. And by bon gens, you mean the, the vicar and those who think like him? Exactly. We met for the first time a few hours ago, but I, I feel that we understand each other. Thank you for saying that. It makes me very proud. Well, I mean it. Oh, look, here are some sheets of my forthcoming book. Oh. Uh, these are just the early pages, of course. Take them to your room and look them over at your pleasure. Oh, Mr. Ambient, I'm so flattered. Take them. Oh, thank you. I'll take them to my room and read them at once. Mark. Beatrice. Well, how is he? I knew you'd be waiting up. Uh, Dolce knows much quieter. He'll probably be quite better in the morning. Ah, uh, I'll go and see for myself. No, no, you, you wake him. Oh. Uh, I, I wish he'd take my word for it. He's certain to wake, don't you know? I'm sure he'll be as quiet as possible. Why don't you go to bed, Mr. Harvey? It's well past midnight. Uh, Mr. Ambient was waiting up, so I stayed to talk to him. Mm. I I'm going now, and I'm taking these proof sheets with me. And they're the opening chapters of his new book. Indeed? I don't take that sort of interest in my husband's proof sheets. I consider his writings most objectionable. Good night. Good night. Good morning, Miss Ambient. Good morning, Mr. Harvey. It's lovely here in the garden, isn't it? Quite lovely. Did you sleep well? Yes, I did. How about you? I usually sleep well, but last night I was worried about Dolcino. How is he today? I hope he's better. I think he is. We might expect to see him later. You must explain something to me, Miss Ambient, because I'm very puzzled. You must know that, to me, your brother is a very great writer. The greatest I have read among living authors. If there is one person in the world who might have been expected to agree with me, it's his wife. And yet last night she told me she considered her husband's writings most objectionable. They were her very words, most objectionable. Now tell me, was she trying to startle me? Or is it the sorry truth that she resents his novels? It's the sorry truth, I'm afraid. But she usually doesn't come out with it so soon. Oh, poor woman. She must have seen I'm a fanatic. Oh, she won't like you for that. Won't like me? She must have found me insufferable. I laid it on with a trowel. Well, you mustn't mind as long as the rest of us like you. Beatrice is really a charming woman. A very strange woman. Maybe, maybe. Beatrice and Mark, unfortunately, are mismated. But they have no differences except this one. Beatrice thinks Mark's writing's immoral and his influence pernicious, and she's afraid for the child. She seems to be trying the whole time to... to keep him away from his father. If she could, she'd prevent Mark from even so much as touching him. Everyone knows it. Visitors see it for themselves, so there's no harm in my telling you. Isn't it excessively odd? It is, certainly. But why does she think like that? Why? Because she's so religious. 
are so tremendously moral. But then some of Mark's ideas are, well, really rather impossible, don't you think? No, I must say I don't. Do you think art is everything? In art, of course I do. But surely with reservations. One must be good, mustn't one? If one must be good, why don't you go to church? On Sunday morning, supreme virtue for me consists in answering the week's letters. By the way, Mr. Harvey, it's not true about Dolcino being better. His mother says he is, but I've seen him, and he's not at all right. But surely his mother would know, wouldn't she? Not necessarily. There are strange elements at work. Strange elements? Do you mean in the constitution of the child? No. I mean in my sister-in-law's feelings. Elements of affection and elements of anxiety. But that's quite natural. Why do you call them strange? Well, undoubtedly there are elements of affection and elements of anxiety, but Beatrice is much more than anxious. You seem very perturbed, Miss Ambient. But his father will have seen Dolcino by now. If he's not satisfied, he'll send for the doctor. Dr. McIntosh ought to have been called already. He lives only a couple of hundred yards away. Ah, your brother is coming now. Oh, Dolcino's on his back. Will you talk to him about calling the doctor? I did, just before I came out. He wanted to talk to Beatrice first. She's just behind them. Ah, good morning. Ah. Oh, morning, Harvey. <laughs> well, here we are with our temporary invalid. Oh, do put him down, Mark. He's not a bit of disease. Would you like to stand on your feet, my boy? Yes, I would. I'm feeling very well now. Oh, well, down you come. Ah. Ah. <laughs> Happy enough? Yes, I am. And now that you're all here, I think I'll go and write my letters. I was keeping Mr. Harvey company till you arrived. See you later. Beatrice, I'm going to walk over to Dr. McIntosh. I don't like bothering him on Sunday, but I think he ought to see Dolcino. That's Gwendolyn's idea, I suppose. It's not such an out-of-the-way idea. The boy is ill. But I'm not ill, Papa. I'm much better. Well, why don't you hop about if you feel so lusty? Because Mama's holding me close. Oh, yes. I know how Mama holds you when I am nearby. You can go for Dr. McIntosh if you like, Mark. Perhaps it would be better. You ought to drive. Ah, she says that to get me out of the way. <laughs> All right, then. I'm off for Dr. McIntosh. Uh, you slept well, Mr. Harvey? Yes, thank you, I did. Uh, I was a little concerned about Dolcino and, and also about something you said to me last night. Oh, what was that? I couldn't get over your description of your husband's work as objectionable. It seems such an immense pity that, that so much interesting writing should be lost on you. Nothing's lost on me, Mr. Harvey. I know he's interesting to many people. Don't you like Papa's books, Mama? No, no, darling, don't interrupt. Won't you read them to me, Mr. Harvey? Oh, uh, well, um, I, I'd rather tell you some stories of my own. I know that some that are awfully good. Oh, when will you tell them to me? Tomorrow? Uh, yes, tomorrow, with pleasure, if that suits you. Well, you're staying tonight, then. Uh, Mr. Ambient asked me to, and I said I'd like to. I hope it won't inconvenience oh, you. Oh, no, no, not at all. When I left you last night, I went to bed with your husband's proof sheets. Yes, I know. We discussed them. I was entranced. I was reading them till three o'clock in the morning. You're certainly an enthusiast. I read them over twice. You say you haven't looked at them. I think it's a pity, a great pity. Let me beg you to take them and read them uh, when you have time. I'm sure they'll convert you. I know he's worked very hard over the new book, but... Uh... Well, uh, I must take Dolcino to the nursery now. The doctor will be here soon. Oh, let me carry him. No, no, he's not heavy. Uh, oh, have you still got the proof sheets of the new book? I put them back in Mr. Ambien's study. Oh, I see. Well, I thought I, I might take your advice. I'm delighted, Mrs. Ambient. It's a wise decision. I'll pick them up on my way. Oh, now we must hurry, Dolcino. The doctor will be here in a minute. Yes, Mama. They're on his desk. Thank you. Oh, hello, Harvey. Oh, you brought the doctor? Yes, he's just gone up to the nursery. I'll be seeing him uh, before he goes. I have some news for you. Yes? What is it? Your wife wants to read those proof sheets. No. It's true. Huh. What has suddenly made her so curious? <laughs> I'm afraid I'm at the bottom of the mystery. Ah. It's been on my conscience that she, of all people, was unable to appreciate the worth of her husband's writings. So I implored her to read the opening chapters of the new book. And she agreed. Well, I'll be... We'll wait and see exactly what value she puts on them. <laughs> She'll probably burn them up, emendations and all. <laughs> and I've got no copy.
Say. Well, what is it? Uh, Dr. McIntosh. That's my name. I won't keep you a moment. I'm a friend of the family. Uh, may I know how Dolcino is this morning? Well, I called to see him, and I'm afraid I haven't. You haven't seen him? Uh, no, Mrs. Ambient met me at the door, told me he was sleeping soundly, didn't want him disturbed. She said he was much better, and that from now on she'd look after him as so. well. But last night? At ten o'clock last night when I called, the boy's condition was serious. But you'll be coming back to see him, surely? Oh, no, sir. I'll be hanged if I'll come back. Yep. Well, I'm damned. What's come over the woman? Good morning, Mr. Harvey. Oh, good morning, Miss Ambient. Uh, aren't you coming out into the garden? Uh, not for a moment or two. Breakfast won't be ready for a little while. I'm waiting to see the doctor. The doctor's gone. What? Was that the doctor who drove off just now? Yes. Did you say that was Dr. McIntosh? Yes. He didn't see the boy. Why not? Mrs. Ambient wouldn't let him. She told him that Dolcina was much better and that she'd look after him herself from now on. She must be off her head. Dolcina's dangerously ill. Yesterday what? evening there was a sudden change for the worse. When the doctor came at 10 o'clock, he said there were symptoms of diphtheria. Diphtheria? Yes. Mark didn't go to bed till Dolcino had quietened down. I sat up very late, then went to the boy's room. The nurse let me in. Mrs. Ambient was sitting by the bed. She held Dolcino's hand in one of hers, and in the other... What do you think? The opening chapters of Mark's new book. She was reading them intently. Did you ever hear anything so strange? What a very odd time to be reading. What a very odd time to be reading an author she never could abide. What happened when you went in? She looked up at me and put her finger on her lips. The nurse was about to go to bed, so I offered to stay up with the boy while Mrs. Ambient snatched a few moments' sleep. She refused. How was Dolcino then? He looked flushed and unnatural. And his breathing was laboured. What change could have taken place in him between then and now to justify Mrs. Ambient refusing to let Dr. McIntosh see him? But what a time to be reading Mr. Ambient's new book. Oh, you better go into breakfast. Mark will be down by now. Good morning, Mark. Morning, Gwendolyn. Morning, Harvey. Good morning. You're both having coffee, aren't you? Yeah, please. Not for me. Will you have tea? No, nothing for me. I, I, I can't eat anything. What is it, Mark? In heaven's name. What's got possession of Beatrice? My poor Mark. Beatrice is always Beatrice. She's locked herself in with that boy, bolted and barred the door. She refuses to let me go near him. She refused to let Dr. McIntosh see him an hour ago. Refused to let McIntosh see him? By God, I'll smash the door in. Uh, Miss Ambient, uh, why don't you go up and, and see if you can reason with her? I, I think I will. I must. Try to see your wife's point of view, Mr. Ambient. Uh, women have an instinct for these matters. She's the boy's mother and, and she's doing what she feels is yes, best. Yes, yes, I know all that. But she can't take the place of the doctor. I argued with her through that closed door for 20 minutes. If you won't let me in, then for God's sake, let the doctor see him. How dared she send him away? Mark! Mark, go for the doctor. Go this moment. What? Is he dying? I don't know, but Beatrice is frightened out of her wits now, and she wants the doctor. He told me he'd be hanged if he came back. That's why Mark must go himself. A messenger would be no good. You must see him, Mark. You must tell him it's to save Dolcino. I'm going. And I'll save him, please God. Shouldn't I have gone instead? No, Mark had to go. I had to get him away, to get him away, while I think, while I think. While you think of what? The unspeakable thing that has happened under this roof. Is the boy dying? Tell me. It's too late to save him. She's let him die. No, no. Don't say that. I say she's let him die. You had the idea of making her read Mark's new book, hadn't you? I've already told you that. I told her she ought to read it. But what has that to do with it? I don't understand you. Yes, you do. You understand me perfectly. Your accusations, monstrous. I say it all. I'm not stupid. It was a book that finished her. The book that decided her. Decided? Are you suggesting that she's murdered her own child? I'm suggesting that she sacrificed him. She made up her mind to do nothing to save him. And why else did she lock herself in? Why else did she turn away the doctor? It was Mark's book that did it. It horrified her. She was convinced it would contaminate her son, so she determined to rescue him, to prevent him from ever being defiled by his father's ideas. Miss Ambient! Dolcino had a crisis at two o'clock in the morning, the nurse told me. Beatrice had called her back. 
The poor child got much worse, but she sent the nurse back to bed again and stayed alone with the boy for the rest of the night. Are you telling me that, that she's insane or that she's pitiless? The nurse told me his mother was holding Dolcino in her arms, but she gave him no remedies. Everything the doctor left is untouched. She's had the honesty not even to throw the drugs away. Miss Ambient, do you know what you're saying? You know I'm telling you the truth. Within the last half hour, she's had a revulsion. She's terrified now at what she's done. She'd give heaven and earth now to save the poor child. Perhaps it's not too late. Perhaps. Uh, shouldn't you stay with her in the nursery? At least till your brother gets back? You better go and judge. Just like a wounded tigress. You've said some harsh things, Miss Ambient. What you've said to me, I can forget readily. But, but you must promise me that you will never tell your brother what you've just told me. What was that? I, I don't know. Dr. McIntosh, what has happened? It's too late. The boy is... He's gone? Yes. If you take my advice, he'll arrange for your sister-in-law to have a long holiday. Oh. Oh, she'll have a serious breakdown. I won't vouch for her sanity. A mark? He's frantic about the boy, but he realises that his chief concern now must be for his wife. Yes, of course. His wife. He considers the tragedy is the result of her extravagant devotion to her son. Her extravagant devotion to her son. If that's what Mr. Ambient thinks. That's what I think, too. Poor little Dolcino. Poor Mark. And poor, poor Beatrice. <laughs> that was Beltraffio by Henry James. Adapted as a play for radio by Norman Ginsbury. The part of Mark Ambient was played by James McKechnie, Beatrice Ambient by Griselda Harvey, Gwendolyn Ambient by Janet Burnell, and Nicholas Harvey by Ronald Wilson. Production for the BBC was by Norman Wright.